Good afternoon, good wonderful Tuesday. This is another great opportunity to come together as a church family of Sechavo Community Church to study God's word together. I just want to start by saying last week when we ended, I want to start by asking for forgiveness because I said we are going to look at the Sermon on the Mount from the book of John. That is incorrect. The book of John has spitting images from the Sermon on the Mount. However, our main focus of the Sermon on the Mount will be from Matthew chapter 5, not John. So I just want to start by clearing that confusion right there. I was the one who was wrong. And as we are starting, I want us to go back a little bit and see that this message that we are starting, this great sermon that was preached by Jesus Christ, the first sermon ever preached in his ministry after chapter 4 when he was tempted and then that 40 days and 40 nights that he finished, then he started his ministry. And the first full sermon after having gathered the disciples, it was in chapter 5 verse 1. And I want us to have a look at a couple of things about this. Before we go deeper into the message, I want to remind you of what Maruti is teaching about the knowability of God. We looked at John chapter 4. What is God like? That God is spirit and all his worshippers should worship him in spirit and in truth. That's what we looked at on Sunday. Now today... I'm recording earlier so that we can have this on time before there's any surprise load sheddings. We are reading from, we're going to only read chapter 5 of Matthew, verse 1 and verse 2. That's the only thing we're going to look at today. Here's why, because we are only introducing the Sermon on the Mount. What it's all about, what the point is with the Sermon on the Mount. And the setting. The setting is like this. This is around Galilee. And Jesus is being followed by multitudes. He's not advertising himself. People are following him. And then he sees a hill or a mount that is overseeing the Sea of Galilee. And he goes up there. And then all those multitudes follow him, including the disciples that he's, he chose and called in earlier chapters of Matthew chapter of, of Matthew chapter four chapter yeah in Matthew chapter four after the temptation he won that temptation and then he went to choose those who would follow him now what I want us to notice is in verse one and verse two let's read it and then we pray before we get into the introduction of what the Sermon on the Mount is really all about. Matthew chapter 5, let's read verse 1 and verse 2. Listen to how it starts. Seeing the crowds, seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. Now, In these two verses, I want us to realize, you and I to realize this. Jesus didn't advertise, didn't invite people to come. He chose the disciples and he said to them, follow me. And they did. But then multitude came with them. And you'll see the multitude as we are going through the the study of the Sermon on the Mount. Now, what, what, what is this all about? In the olden days, there was no microphone. Therefore, for your voice to be projected at a higher volume, you need to go a bit higher and the people that are listening to you will sit down and then when you speak, then your voice will be augmented by the sheer position of where you're standing. So that is how he was, he was sitting at the mount and then his people that were listening to his message were a bit downhill. And then his voice can be projected to cover everyone and they can hear what he says. And Matthew was among those who were listening. 
And when we read where we just read, it is just an introductory phase. And I'm going to show you five things that we are going to learn in the Sermon on the Mount. Five things that we are going to learn. Number one, we are going to learn that God is our dad. God is Abba. That is our dad. Do you see how personal that gets? He's not some far distant being who is a creator and punishes everyone who does wrong. No, he's our dad. He's our father. Number one. Number two, we're going to learn that he sees and cares about our hearts, our intentions, our attitudes. That's what we are going to see in the Sermon on the Mount. And then we're also going to see that this is not a list of do's and don'ts. It's not a list of do's and don'ts because it's about attitude, your intention, not what you are actually doing. It's not outward religiosity. It's not just your routines or your rituals, but it is about who you are from the inside. And that's what God is concerned about. And then number four, we're going to see that there is no law that Jesus, when he was teaching here, there's no law from God that he replaced. In fact, he actually fulfilled the law. And we will see how that will affect us as we are going into the introduction. So those are the five things that we are going to learn. Did I say number five? No. Number five is we must trust him. We must trust him and then Remember, there are four things that stress us as human beings under the sun. is clothes, food, drink, and shelter. These are the four things that consume our minds all the time. And the more scarce they get, the more stressful and anxious we become. And the more we have them, the more arrogant and pompous we become as well. So, two extremes. You get anxious and stressful when you don't have these four things. And when you have them in abundance, you get arrogant, pompous, and proud. And then you become con a control freak or you become somebody who looks down on others who are lacking in these four things. Food, shelter, drink, and clothes. Those are the things that Jesus also spoke about, that don't be worried about those things. Let's start with number one. God is our dad. God is our father. He's not a scary being that just wants to get you when you're not doing something. He's not just a big punisher. But he's really concerned about our obedience. And to show that he's our dad, that's why he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him may not perish. And this is initiated by God, the one who's going to judge everyone. He initiates a solution to our problem, our sin problem, the one we cannot solve by ourselves. And he knew that, he knows that, that's why our dad, who cares about us, provides a way out from perishing. And he gives us Jesus who came to die for our sin. In Matthew chapter 1 verse 21, you don't have to read it, he says there, when in the introduction of Jesus, Matthew chapter 1 verse 21, that he will come to save his people from their sin. And somebody might read that and say it meant Jewish people because he, was, he, was, he came in the family of the Jews in the line of David. However, if you go back to the line of David, you'll realize that in fact, that is from the line of God himself because Jesus was not born of the seed of David, but is in the family of David. 
This is profound to see because it's not born by the will of man. The seed that made sure that Mary is impregnated is not the seed of a man, but it is from God directly. So you cannot say it's a Jewish seed. No, it's not. It's a seed from God. And then this goes deeper into the line of Melchizedek and it's not the point of the message today. I'm just trying to introduce you to the Sermon on the Mount and to who was speaking and he was speaking to the people and the person who was speaking is Jesus Christ who does not have a lineage that is related to manhood or led by men but it is from God and therefore when the when Matthew chapter 1 verse 21 says his people he's talking about those who come in faith those who are granted or given the gift of believing in him and that's everyone on the planet not limited to Jews God is our dad that's what we're going to see as you're going through this number two God is concerned about what is in our heart, not what we do. That is why this is not a list of do's and don'ts. It's not about religion. In fact, it's a confrontation of tradition, a confrontation of religious, religious practices that were there in that time. Even today, this is still a challenge that normal routines of going to church every Sunday and doing things that are traditional, that is the outward uh, performance or outward worship. But what God is really interested in is the internal heart commitment to him. And you'll see that as he keeps challenging the status quo, when he says, you have heard that it has been said, this and this, that is in Matthew chapter, 20, chapter 5, verse 22, verse 28, verse 32, verse 39, verse 34. That's where some of the places where he said, but I say, you heard that they were teaching you this, but I say, meaning the traditional authorities, the religious authorities are teaching you one, two, three. However, I say this. And Whatever he was saying was attacking the attitude behind the act to show that indeed God is really concerned about our heart, not what we do outwardly, but what we do from inside. How that, whatever the action you are doing, how did it come about? The attitude, the intention behind and we will see this as we are going through the lessons from the greatest sermon that Jesus has ever preached. Remember, Sermon on the Mount is from chapter 5 of Matthew, chapter 6 and chapter 7. And Luke also touched on it, covered this as well. And we will look at him as well. And some sporadic references to the Sermon on the Mount by John. We will look at that as well. And then number three, this is not a list of do's and don'ts. It's not a list, it's not about religion. Here's why. Because number one, we know that none of us can do all of these things that Jesus is going to cover here. Why? Because Paul in the book of Romans, he mentioned that we all fell short. We all fall short of the glory of God. We are all sinners, all of us. Everyone under the sun, born of women, is a sinner. And we fall short. That is why, no matter what you try to do every day to try and please God and gain his favor, you will falter at some point. And when you falter once, then you join the rest of us. You are also a sinner. So therefore, you cannot read the Sermon on the Mount and say, I'm going to do everything that Jesus was talking about. No. 
on your own and in and of yourself, it is impossible to do all of this because we are sinners. As long as you're still in this flesh, you will sin and you are sinning. And if you claim otherwise, you are a liar. You are lying to yourself and you are not being honest. And that is sin right there. So you cannot claim that you're not a sinner. We are all sinners and we need mercy. We need grace. We need love. We need salvation. We need to be saved. And all of these things, you cannot earn them. They can only be given unto you by God who initiates salvation. Love from God, grace from him, that's favor, and salvation from him. They come from God as a gift to us. And remember, he, give, he gives grace to who? To the humble. The biggest mistake we can make as human beings is to trust in our abilities, trust in our capabilities. Don't do that. Once you do that, then arrogance is bred, fed, and grows, and then you don't need a savior because you think there's a savior inside you. You think there's something good and right that you can do in and of yourself. Once you believe that, then salvation, how you don't need it because you think you can save yourself. And grace, you don't need somebody's favor. You think you got it covered. You can achieve greatness. You can achieve righteousness. You can achieve the right living with God. You think you can save yourself from your own sins and you can't. Once you believe that, then you are pushing God aside. And that's why you will not receive the salvation of the Lord. Nor his love because you believe in loving yourself because of your capabilities, your resourcefulness, your intellect. And you think all of that, they just came from a black hole. And you trust in yourself. Once you do that, then you are discarding God's involvement in helping you out from your own sin. Then, number four, remember, there is no law that Jesus replaced. Jesus did not replace any law. We're going to see this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, going forward. We're going to see that Jesus is saying, Everything that was in the law of God, not the bylaws that were created by this, the, the elders of the people of Israel, but the actual law from God that was delivered. Not even one letter of that law would be broken or abolished because he is fulfilling it. We can fulfill it by ourselves. He did it on our behalf because of his mercy, his kindness, his love. He did it on our behalf. That's why when you believe in him, then his righteousness is propitiated to you or credited to you. Your faith in him is credited to you as righteousness because of his righteousness. He's spotless, sinless, and he obeyed each and every one of those commandments from the attitude level, from the heart level, to the implementation of that law. So, let's not think that when Jesus came with grace and truth, according to John chapter 1, verse 17, it says there, for the law was given through Moses by God, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Do you see that? And no one, that is John chapter 1 verse 17, 
And this comes from, in verse 16, he says, For from his fullness, the fullness of Christ, we have all received what? Grace upon grace, blessing upon blessing. However, from the law, remember from the law, if you don't, because no one can live according to the law, what happens? We all fall short and then we face the curse of the law. But in Christ, whether you sin or not, if you believe in him, he forgives and cleanses you from all unrighteousness and presents you blameless and holy to God. Then you don't have to face judgment, the great white throne. If you trust in Christ, you are righteous through him, in him. But if you still trust in yourself in believing and obeying the law, then the curse of the law is upon you. Curse upon curse, not grace upon grace. According to John chapter 1 verse 16. Now, another thing, number five. Trust in Christ. This is what we're going to see in the Sermon on the Mount. You ought to trust in Christ. From Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, remember those four things we spoke about? Clothes, food, drink, and shelter. All of these are things that we are anxious about, we worry about, we work for. But the Lord is reminding us that he cares for us a lot. He's our dad. Remember, he's our father. And he knows what we need to live on this planet that he placed us in. He created us. He created the planet as well. And he knows the challenges. He cursed this planet, by the way, due to our sin through our grandfather, Adam, and our grandmother, Eve. Now, because of all of that, he knows what we need to survive. We need all of those things. They're basic needs of human survival. And he will provide, and he does provide them. Think about it. Wherever you are, think about all of those four things and realize that they are there. Whether you are employed, whether you are not, you will receive food, drink, shelter, and clothes. I know it might not be the kind of shelter we all envy and desire. However, you do have them. But we will look at that when we get to Matthew chapter 6 in detail. Now, because of that, trust him completely. Because he is faithful, he is compassionate, and he loves you. And he would like to see you do better and be righteous. And finally, in Matthew chapter 7, the final chapter of the Sermon on the Mount, and the, from verse 28 to verse 29, that's where we see the authority of Jesus Christ. The authority of Jesus Christ. I just want to read you something about his authority, and then I will summarize what our journey, how our journey will be through chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7 of this Sermon on the Mount. In Philippians chapter 2, talking about his authority. In Philippians chapter 2, look at verse 9 until verse 11. Read with me in Philippians chapter 2 from verse 9 until verse 11. Listen to what it says there. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the time, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, under the earth, and every tongue confess that indeed Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Everything 
that Jesus did while on the planet was to the glory of the Father. And now all authority is given to him. And when we confess him as Lord, then we do that to the glory of the Father. Jesus, when he spoke when you read Matthew chapter 7, verse 28 to 29, you'll notice that people were amazed, were at awe at his authority and how he spoke because they're not used to it. He doesn't speak like me. There are no notes. He's not referring. He is only referring to the law that was delivered by God, not the interpretations by men who are called scribes, Sadducees, Sadducees, Pharisees, He's not quoting any of them, those that are learned at that time, the theologians of the time, the religious authorities of the time. He's not even referring or quoting their teachings, but he is only referring to the law delivered by God and his interpretation was, was looked at as revolutionary for the people who were under the do's and don'ts of the religious authorities at that time. Even in our generation, there are many people who are still living according to the do's and don'ts, don't touch, don't touch. And that's the religiosity mindset that is oppressing people from the real liberty of grace and truth that came through Jesus Christ. Now, without Christ, there is no hope. We're going to see this next week when we start with the Beatitudes or the blessings or the things that bring real joy. You want real joy? We're going to stay tuned. We're going to look together in the Beatitudes. We're going to break the Beatitudes into, because there are quite many, we're going to break them into three parts. We're going to look at the first three. So we'll look at them in three, three, because there are nine there. Uh, those that are poor, mourn, and meek. Those that are who, those who hunger. Those that are merciful. Now, observe this. In the Beatitudes, the first three is what you cannot do anything about. It's what happens to you, right? Poverty, grief and weakness that comes to you. We'll look at that next week. And then the following week, we're going to look at your attitudes, your intentions, and what you are after, the direction of your life. Those who hunger, those who are merciful, those who are pure, then we will see that together. And by the way, you must notice something. Where it describes our attitudes, most of us fall short. And if we are honest with ourselves. And then the week after that, we will look at, again, the peacemakers. That's who you are, right? That's the last of the who you are. But then we go back to what happens to you. Now, these are the persecuted and the reviled. And then we will look at all of that. And then in the following weeks that because I see I don't have time to go through all of this because it's quite long. We will look at that. But in summary, what we will look at is the meaning of blessings or the, the real meaning of joy, which is what blessings mean or beatitudes mean. It's not in material possessions, it's not in tradition, and it's not found in the law. There's none there. We'll look at that in detail as we are traveling together through Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. And we are going to look at how to pray. Some people call it the Lord's Prayer. However, this is the disciple's prayer. And a disciple just means the follower of Jesus Christ. That's you and I in our generation. Because he was talking to his disciples when he was teaching them how to pray. So this is the disciple's prayer, not necessarily the Lord's Prayer. But I understand it comes from the Lord teaching his disciples number three we are now we will also look at how then 
to live our daily life in peace or in harmony, in obedience to the owner of our hearts. That is our God, the Father, our dad. Remember, he's our dad. How to live in harmony with him and his commandments. How should we do this? And the Lord is going to show us all of this. Remember, our joy is not found in material position. It's not found in tradition or routines or rituals. It's not found in law. Because the law comes with curses. But Jesus comes with the grace and truth. That is the introduction to our message that we are going to look at in this coming few weeks. May God richly bless you as you are considering believing completely and wholeheartedly to Jesus Christ, the only hope for humanity, the only hope for transformation is Jesus Christ and nobody else, nothing else, not even yourself. Let's pray. Lord, we come to your throne of grace and we thank you for your introductory message into the first sermon you ever preached while on the planet. Help us, Lord, to understand the precepts and your teachings and the spirit behind the teachings that you taught us in this impactful message that you preached on that mountain in Galilee. And Lord, some of us are still doubting to follow you. Convict us as we are, we are looking into this and listening to this message from you so that we repent and come to the knowledge of your truth. For those of us that are saved, revive our hearts to evangelize to our family members, to evangelize to those that are close to us about this message of hope, message of grace and of truth that is transformative and to make sure that your redemptive work is achieved and many are saved from sin. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>